Christ's ascension, a bridge over troubled water, and keeping our head in the clouds. Those are our topics today. Welcome to this episode of Pearls of the Interior Life. Thank you for making this time for the Lord. As always, very good to be with you for it. Let's open with the sign of the cross in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. First, at the link below, we have a free guide to Ignatian discernment. How do we hear God's voice and make decisions in a fallen world with all of the noise around us? So intimately related to everything we do in the spiritual life, including our topic for today. Again, the Ascension. This Sunday, when this is being recorded, is the seventh Sunday of Easter. When we celebrate Thursday is Ascension Thursday. That's 40 days out from Easter, traditionally, when, when we understand from Scripture, when Christ was returned bodily back up to heaven, generally celebrated, though, these days on Sunday. And we want to look at three things. First, just very broadly, what the Ascension is intended to mean for all of us. Then we want to look very specifically at practical ways we connect in that, and our guide for that is St. Catherine of Siena, just an extraordinary person by any measure. And then third, we just want to look then specifically, what does that mean for us heading into this weekend, having the Ascension foremost in our minds? How does it apply then to our everyday life? So first, the Ascension and how it relates to us in Christ's saving mission for us in Scripture. In Acts chapter 1, we're told that as the apostles were, were speaking with Christ when he finished talking and giving them their great commission, they watched him get lifted up and disappear in the clouds. So that raising up in the clouds, those are very potent images. There's a lot going on here. St. Thomas Aquinas likens that cloud to the Old Testament in Exodus and Numbers, the Shekinah fire, the Holy Spirit, that presence of God that would come down over the Ark of the Covenant or over the tabernacle and guide the people or guide the early Levitical priests. St. John Chrysostom, likewise, he looks to Psalms where it says that the clouds are my chariots. We see the cloud in Christ's transfiguration in, in the New Testament. So the, the cloud, it's that presence, that manifestation of the supernatural reality of God. And the, the raising up yeah, we get this. I, the, the raising up, that, that's always an elevation of ourselves. What happens when we look down? First time, the first, the first time we see that is in Scripture when first Adam and Eve, when they, they don't necessarily look down, but they, they look away. They won't look at God. Cain, after he kills Abel, he looks down. He won't look up at God. Peter, when he's sinking into the water, what does he do? He looks down. He's walking on water, but then he looks down and and he goes into the drink. We know this in, in our life. Why are you down? Why are you downcast? What's the opposite? When we look up, lift up your heart, lift up your spirits. Things are looking up. So the elevation in the clouds, these are just symbolic to having our human nature elevated to the reality of God. The actual ascension, if you will, and what we're all called to is really a, a spiritual and, and for us more of an interior trip that it, that is taken to God in our interior. Christ is going into that mystery of God. Yeah, it's not, not a, a, a physical thing at all. It is wholly supernatural. But, but here's the other part. Frank Sheed, in his wonderful treatises on theology, he'll ask a rhetorical question, you know, Jesus becomes man and he takes on a human soul. He has both a divine and a human nature. He has a human soul. <laughs> and Frank Sheet asks, why? What does God need to do with a human soul? And then he answers the question, well, he does with it everything that can possibly be done. He uses it to the full. And yeah, I've, I've <laughs> no correction there. Of course, just about everything Frank Sheet says is, is manifest. But I would just add to it one thing, Christ also takes on a human body. Why? What can he do with a human body? Well, everything that can be done with it, including completely sacrificing it. But he also shows our bodies are made to be taken up 
into heaven. And that's ultimately what we're here for, why we're created, and what our body is capable of doing. And that point is made as well by Justin Martyr, where he writes, And when he had thus shown them that there is truly a resurrection of the flesh, wishing to show them this also, that it is not impossible for flesh to ascend into heaven. And one other reference point, the cloud of unknowing, that great anonymously authored spiritual masterpiece that is in this life, we're meant to extend ourselves to the very furthest of our spiritual powers, where we can just ever so slightly penetrate that cloud into the heavenly order, even in this life, the cloud of unknowing. So the point being here, we're, we're meant to walk around with our head in the clouds in the right way, you know, not in an, an immature buffoonish way, but always having that reality of our heavenly destiny and that we even can attain to a taste of it here on earth. This brings us to our next point, St. Catherine of Siena. She gets very practical about this. St. Catherine of Siena, we're going to come back to some points about her life. Let's first get to what she has to say about the Ascension and Christ. Then we're going to go back and hear who exactly who this is that's talking to us about this. Her great spiritual masterwork is called The Dialogue, and it's her dialogue with God, primarily God the Father speaking with her at length and truly speaking with her like <laughs> we're speaking right now and in that dialogue god reveals christ as the bridge the the bridge the bridge from our fallen humanity to our divinized destiny in heaven and listen to this this bridge taking its point of departure in you rose into heaven and was the one road which was taught you by the example and life of the truth. And it continues, And so, wishing to remedy your great evils, I have given you the bridge of my Son, in order that, passing across the flood, you may not be drowned, which flood is the tempestuous sea of this dark life. So there it is, the, the bridge, which is Christ. It starts in us. It starts in us, and it continues to its completion. It says, and Catherine goes on at some length, you can read for this yourself in, in her dialogues, at some length how that is completed in Christ's ascension. So we have the two endpoints. You know, we begin in ourself, we end with the ascension, with being brought into heaven with Christ. And th this is, again, voiced by all the spiritual masters. Father Gary Lagrange says, even desiring, even just desiring God, that little spark of grace in us is when we start down the mystic path. That's when we take that first tentative step onto the bridge. And then so long as we stay on the bridge, and the bridge, he says, is Christ and his doctrine, his teaching that's been carefully preserved and passed on through the church. When we stay on the bridge, that will that'll keep us over those surging waves of the flood of all the fallen world and bring us through to the ascension. Those two endpoints that, that tether everything. And once we're on the bridge, that is where we're going as long as we stay on it. So this is worth reflecting on. We'll have links in the description. You can go and, and read this for yourself. I just, there's obviously much more to this, but this can be a very beautiful imagery to turn to because yet, yes, we're here in the world with all of its messiness. And, and don't we know it? I, I don't need to go on here and catalog the madness of the world around us. But this is a different way of looking at being in the world, but not of the world that we're passing safely over it. You know, does the spray from the ocean still come up and and dampen us? You know, do, do we maybe feel the, the bridge shake a little bit? Probably not much. I think that's, that's stretching the analogy too far. But yes, 
that the surging waves are right there and the bridge isn't that high the bridge is only three steps up so we're right there by the water probably so we can help people and give them a hand up good lord willing if we have the opportunity the the three steps are mem memory and our intellect and our will more on that at another time the theology of saint catherine but but the bridge is safely above and yes we do get that spray from the water and Catherine and the Lord, they talk about that as well. Listen to this. Whatever happens to you, never think that it comes from men. Think that it comes from God and is for your good. And then see how you may profit by it. Yet when we're on the bridge, yes, bad things are going to, bad depending on how you look at it. Challenging things will happen in this life. But if we're on the bridge, all of it is used for good. All of those trials, all those challenges, we can see, ah, here's how God's turning that around. Here's how God's using it for my salvation. Here's how God is using it to help other people find their way to him. Here is how God is using it for his glorification. As we're up above, yeah, we see the waves, we see all the mess, but we're safely above it. We're not completely isolated from it, but we are safe. And we're continuing forward to where the ascension the ascension anchors the other end. We know where we're going. It makes, and when you have that destination in mind, you can be stuck in a traffic jam on driving to the beach and, ah, oh, boy, this is just miserable. It's hot. The air conditioning broke in the car and whatever else. But I know where I'm going. I know where I'm going. I can put up with a little traffic jam. It gives me a chance to pray another rosary, what have you. But we rise above that. And then you know, lastly, this is where we started out this journey back at the beginning of Lent. What happens? Christ goes out into the desert. What does Satan want to do? Satan wants to drag him down into the messiness of the world. And he says, yeah, don't bother with all of that crucifixion business. Oh, you know how painful that is. I can just give you the world right now. Let's just not bother with any of that stuff. Just come on down here. Just bow to me. I'll give you the world. There's our little shortcut. All done. Nice and neat. No, no, Christ vanquishes him. He stays above. He rises above all that. So when we stay close to him, we stay on that bridge. We go over. We completely bypass all of that messiness of the world that otherwise will suck us downstream and, and drown us. That is the power of this imagery. A little bit about Catherine of Siena, because it's worth coming back to this image of the bridge. It's really worth reading her, her dialogue her dialogue with God. But the saints are given to us as great gifts. They show us what it means to model our life after Christ. And often there's a whole psychology about the, the zone of proximate development when we can see someone who's sort of like us, but more elevated, but still say, boy, they're human. They were able to do this. And, and it inspires us. And Catherine of Siena, even as saints go, and doctors of the church, so she's like the best of the best, there are some who even people are loath to rate saints, but would put her as potentially the greatest, even of the doctors. She died at the young age of 33. At age six, she had already completely committed herself to God. As a teenager, she came from a large family. Her, her parents originally expected her to get married. That was the only path. She lived in the 1300s. That was the only path forward then. And obviously she was in, in Spain, Catherine of Siena. But no, she just refused. She had promised herself to God, taken a vow of chastity, just completely committed herself to, to him. For three years, she lived in the family home as a hermit, as a teenager. And then after very powerful mystic experiences, she was always given to powerful mystic experiences, God called her out to a life in the world. Well, very soon, as a teenager, going out in the world, this is also a time of, of plagues and ministering to people and having tremendous wisdom uneducated. She could not read until she was 20. Completely uneducated. Great wisdom. She started building a spiritual community. She had adults. She had priests. She had religious coming to her and viewing her as their spiritual mother. In time, her own mother, her own biological mother, came to view St. Catherine as her spiritual mother. So deep and great was her wisdom. Soon, People were coming to her even in worldly affairs to solve problems for them. And that's how she became known as kind of a statesman and a diplomat of sorts, eventually calling the Pope back from Avignon, where the Pope 
had left Rome. It was a time of great turbulence and wars and, and social unrest. And the Pope had escaped to France and got probably a little too comfortable there. And she reasoned and harangued the Pope to come back to Rome. So great was her influence, 30 years old. And, and a time, and, and a woman, and an uneducated woman at that. You know, say the church doesn't have a place for women, get out of here. That's just the beginning of things. She had arguably every mystical gift that is known to be favored upon humans. Now, here's just a short list. Levitation, reading souls, performing exorcisms, bilocation, exchange of hearts, mystical death, ecstasies, visitations from Christ and the saints. She particularly loved the voice of Mary Magdalene. She was a victim stole. She had the stigmata. She subsisted solely on the Eucharist. <laughs> mystical wedding, being married mystically to Christ. She had a, a wedding band placed on her finger by Christ. Only she could see it. I, uh, the secular world would say it was just a figment of her imagination. We, we know differently in the events of her life bore that out at, at the wedding. This is just so, so charming and perfect. Obviously, Christ was there, the Blessed Mother, Saints Peter, Paul, and John the Evangelist. And then, you know, like you're planning your wedding. What do you do? What, you know, where should we have it? Who, who should be in the wedding? Who's the wedding party? Who should do the music? Oh, I know. King David playing the harp. <laughs> That's who did the music at her mystical betrothal to Christ. But this is born out. When, this is an uneducated woman. When you read the dialogue, there is such deep and penetrating philosophy. The, the, the highest of the Greek philosophy that was eventually then perfected and elevated through Thomas Aquinas is reflected in her writings. This from an ignorant young girl, which she wrote the dialogue, I think she was under 20 or around 20, when that was inspired in her. It's really God's words that, that were just dictated down. She dictated the whole thing to one of her many scribes, even at that point in time, people were already putting themselves in her service to write down these tremendous spiritual insights that she would have. One other thing, what really marked her perfection was her perfected love of God, through which she perfected her renunciation of self-love in exchange then for a perfect love of self and neighbor and just she would go to no limit to help the people placed before her by God, especially spiritually, to suffer for their salvation. And you know, it, there's the real fruit of a life given to God. So when we encounter th these kinds of saints that are giving us this type of imagery that was given to them directly by God, it, it's worth spending time with it and seeing how our own soul connects with it, that imagery of the bridge, that we start out that first step, just that first furtive step of desiring God, and then continuing on that bridge, envisioning him at the other end, you know, waving to us, just his arms getting wider and wider as we get closer and closer to him, desiring that, praying for that, letting God then lead us forward in that path towards him because that is the true meaning of the ascension for us what god desires for us as the endpoint of our life on earth that complete and full and glorious reunion with him lastly then going into the weekend what are those little ways that we can keep our head in the clouds not being of the world. What are the little things that we might renounce or the big things that we might have planned that seem too much? I remember when we were thinking of doing homeschooling, that just seemed too much. Oh, come on, the world doesn't homeschool, uh, at least then in the area we were at. And that's just having your head in the clouds. That's not practical. How are you ever going to get into college or get a good job or whatever? And in the end, we did it. We took that first step and it led to another step and another step. And it was very successful for us starting this apostolate into your life. This was not a practical thing to do. Little things in life. I've given up mostly on watching action adventure movies. This is my great happy little distraction, but it 
overwhelms my imagination too much. It just, my mind will start thinking on the phony physics in the movies and sp instead of spending time in, on prayer or interceding for others, I get too distracted by it. Uh, but just, you know, say, yeah, I'm not going to have that as a little diversion. So you think, well, why not? The rest of the world watches those movies. Why can't I? Well, <laughs> because it's, it's better to have my head in the clouds. Um, what are those things, big or little, where God is saying, don't be like the world. Walk around with your head in the clouds. Even better yet, come keep your head in the clouds while you're walking along my bridge. With that, I wish you a marvelous Ascension Sunday, and I look forward to being with you again.